feel really grateful to be able to be here worshiping with you this morning. Uh, I'm Barry. I'm the pastor here at Redemption, and just want to welcome you to, to worship this morning. Uh, we are in the Lenten season right now, that 40-day period uh, between Ash Wednesday prior to uh, the celebration of Easter and the resurrection of Jesus. And uh, it's, a, it's, a strange, it's a strange season to me. Uh, first of all, when I first became a Christian, I didn't realize that Easter had anything to do with Jesus. Uh, I, I, I didn't know that it was about the resurrection. Uh, nobody told me that. They told me a lot about rabbits, uh, eggs, and chocolate. <laughs> there, there was a lot of food involved. But when I, when I discovered that Easter was actually about the resurrection of Jesus, I felt both thrilled and kind of angry. Like I thought, people have been holding out on me. Like, why, why didn't they say that Easter was about Jesus? And so... If, if you're in that position, just know you are not alone. But, but, but Lent is a strange season to me. Uh, it's a season in which we reflect on and celebrate a number of mysteries. Um, we, we celebrate that God uh, came as a human being and gave his life for us. Uh, we celebrate that somehow... What looks like loss is supposed to result in gain. That what looks like defeat, and sometimes feels like defeat, actually leads to victory. Uh, we, we celebrate that laying down our lives is the key to gaining our lives. And if we could have that first slide... That'd be great. Thank you. Uh, this is my slide for our message series during Lent. Uh, the, the series is entitled The Way of the Cross. And part of what we're celebrating here is that the cross is both God's means of salvation and the model of faithfulness to God. So the, the cross is the means of God's salvation, of his forgiveness and mercy, of reconciliation with God and with one another, of deliverance and healing and the possibility of new life. Uh, it's the sign of a life of purpose and meaning and fruitfulness and intimacy with him. And the cross is a model of faithfulness to God, and that sometimes gets lost. Uh, we, we saw this last week in 1 Peter 2, that Jesus suffered for us, leaving us an example for us to follow in his steps. And so part of what Lent is about is, is reflecting on that example. What did Jesus show us about what it means to be faithful? And then how might we follow in his steps? So uh, let's pray, and then we'll get into the message for this morning. Father, thank you for your love for us. Uh, thank you for uh, sending Jesus to come and to rescue us and to show us how to live. And I pray, Lord, that we would live into uh, the full humanity uh, for which you've made us. So I think some of us are, maybe all of us, are, are living subhuman lives. And I pray that you would elevate us, that you would help us to learn what it really means to be human. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week we saw that uh, the example of, of, of Jesus starts with embracing a life of suffering for the, for the sake of love. So it's not suffering for its own sake, it's suffering to be able to care for people. And in that process, part of what is involved is the laying down of our rights and privileges. There are things that we were born into, things to which we are entitled. And everything in the world says that we should fight for our rights. And Jesus says, we lay down our rights. 
we, we, we put them down for the sake of loving people. Uh, this morning, uh, I've entitled the message, The Way of Faith. Uh, but it, it, it may not be exactly what people are thinking when they think of faith. Uh, sometimes when people think of faith, they think of mind power. Like, I'm going to believe something really hard. And if I believe it enough, somehow, mystically, out in the universe, it will create the thing that I want, if I believe hard enough. Uh, the kind of faith that we're talking about is the faith uh, of trusting in someone which leads to action. So there's an old, old hymn that says, trust and obey, right? For there's no other way uh, to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Obedience isn't just, well, God's bigger than you are and more powerful and he'll crush you like a like a cockroach if you don't obey. Um, the idea is that there's someone that we trust, and even when we can't see it, we are willing to take a step. Does anybody recognize this photo? Nobody can recognize it? Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Plus one for Ezekiel. In the, in the pop culture sweepstakes, he's ahead of all of you. Oh. No, this is, this is that scene. So, so Indiana Jones is, is running through all of these tests, right, trying to get to the Holy Grail. And uh, this, is the, this is the final test. He, he, he gets to a chasm that is too far to leap across. But he sees no way to cross. And so he looks in his little book, and the book has a picture of a guy stepping out onto the air, and he just thinks it's impossible. Like, it can't be done. And, and what he ends up doing is, spoiler alert for a film that's like 40 years old, <laughs> even though he can't see how this is possible, he takes a step, and this is, the, this is that photo. They kind of freeze-framed it where he's like stepping, and then he steps, and it turns out that there is a bridge there. It was just camouflaged so that he couldn't see it, but he is able to walk all the way across on this bridge. And when they, when they I wish I had a photo of this, when they shoot the bridge from the other side, it's this, it's this rock bridge that's pretty wide. Like there's, he was never in danger. But from the other side, it felt like, oh my gosh, like th this is just going to end really poorly. And uh, he's willing to take a step anyway. He has to trust in a promise even when he can't see. And so that's some of what we're going to talk about this morning. And in particular, we're going to talk about two different faces of faith. Two different faces of faith. Because faith doesn't always look the same. All right. Uh, kudos to Trish and Ian who have this thing working. Hallelujah. Okay. So, so this is the first of two scriptures, Matthew 21, starting in verse 12. Uh, it says that Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. In, in the Mark version of this passage, it says uh, a house of prayer for all nations. It's just a quote from Isaiah. Uh, but you are making it a robber's den. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. So this is the first picture of faith, the, the first face of faith. And that face is to boldly make a change. To boldly make a change. Jesus sees something that is evil, and he confronts it 
vigorously. So this is near the end of Jesus' life. He, he's been acclaimed as king coming into Jerusalem. It's a dangerous political time for him because the Romans were ruling Israel. And, and for him to be proclaimed as a king uh, would make him an insurrectionist. So he, he, could, be, he could be killed. Um, he shows up at the temple and he doesn't like what he sees. There are money changers and, and people selling doves and other animals for sacrifice. So what, what is going on here? Uh, the the uh, requirement at the temple was that you needed uh, a certain kind of money to be able to make purchases for sacrifice and this kind of thing. And people were coming from all over the world. They were coming from different locations. They had different kinds of money. And so they needed to change their money to be able to buy animals for sacrifice. And then, of course, if they came from very far away, it's really hard to bring your animals for sacrifice. And so uh, it was much easier to travel to Jerusalem and then to, to buy an animal to sacrifice when you got there. And so what's happened here is they very conveniently set up a way to do this. So it's kind of one-stop shopping, right? You, you go to the temple, and right at the temple, there's a place where you can change your money and where you can buy the animals that you need to sacrifice. So one way of looking at what these guys are doing is they are facilitating worship. They're making worship more convenient, more... Uh, they're making it easier for people to worship the Lord. So how is that bad? Uh, why, why is this problematic? Uh, people in our day, especially if you hear people decrying commercialism and this kind of thing, they think, oh, you know, those dirty, money-grubbing people, they're there making a profit in the temple, and they shouldn't have done it. Um, that's not impossible, except that Jesus' explanation is a quote from Isaiah 56, verses 6 and 7. So Jesus tells them what he's doing and why he's doing it. Uh, here's what he says, Isaiah 56, verses 6 and 7. It says that the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even those I will bring to my holy mountain, which is where the temple is, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all peoples, for all nations. Okay, so this is why Jesus is, is upset he expects the temple to be a certain kind of place, a place where all people can worship the Lord. They can all come to pray. They can all come to know him and to serve him, right? But here's a diagram of the temple. Now, this is more complicated than I meant for it to be. It's just the one that I found, okay? But you'll notice that there's kind of a main temple Right? Think of it like the bullseye of a target. This is where the most holy place was, uh, where the priests serve God and this kind of thing. And then you could think of it like a target with concentric circles going outward. So in the, in the bullseye is where God lives, right? And then in the next circle out, that says the court of the priests, it's the place where the priests are allowed in, right? And then outside of that is the court of Israel, which is where Jewish men could be. And then outside of that is the court of women, so it's Jewish women. And then on the very outside is the court of the Gentiles. Um, so they're the furthest out, but there's a space for them, a place where they are allowed to come and to pray and to worship God. Guess where 
all of this money changing and sale of animals and things is going on. Yeah, it's going on in the court of the Gentiles. And so, so it is true that what these guys are doing is, uh, is facilitating worship. But they are facilitating worship for some people at the expense of others. They're making it easier for Jews to be able to worship God. But if you were a Gentile and you came to pray, you have to do it right in the middle of this big flea market, right? With animals and money changing and all these things going on because they're in your space. And Jesus thinks that this is evil. And he is not going to stand for that. He, uh, he takes bold action. He turns over tables. He drives them out of the temple area. Uh, and then he demonstrates God's heart. He welcomes the blind and the lame, those who had previously been excluded. Uh, he welcomes them into the temple and he heals them. Uh, so he doesn't just welcome them and say, well, you can be the way you are. He, he brings them in and he, he makes them well. So where am I going with this? <laughs> uh, one face of faith is to find what is broken and bent in the world and to make a change to boldly confront evil and to not leave the world the way that we found it. It's a dangerous thing, right, to, to take a bold step like that. And uh, I, I'm going to give you a little warning ahead of time. As we'll see, that is a move that takes discernment. Uh, there is a lot that's wrong with the world. And we can't correct it all. In fact, we're not called to correct it all. But I do believe that we have a part in God's plan to rescue and redeem and restore the world. And that is a personal thing. We, we do it with people in witness, in healing, in loving service, in generosity. I also think that it's structural. It's systemic uh, in confronting injustice, for instance, or in caring for creation by stewarding it wisely and restoring it where possible. Um, okay. So that is one face of faith, is this bold confrontation of the brokenness and evil in the world and, and being actively a part in trying to restore it. Here's the other face, Matthew 26. This is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. It says that Jesus came with them, his disciples, this is after the Lord's Supper, uh, to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup, oops, sorry, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Got too many things going on here. Okay. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, so you could not keep watch for me for one hour? Uh, my version says uh, you men could not keep watch with me. You'll notice men is, is in italics. It's not there in Greek. I have no idea why they put it there. But uh, anyway... Uh, keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. 
The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again uh, a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Again, uh, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. And then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. So this is what I'm calling the second face of faith. The, the, the first face was finding the brokenness and evil in the world and confronting it directly, um, boldly, taking it on, and trying, to, trying to correct it. And this is almost like the opposite. Uh, in this case, faith looks like yielding. Uh, it's yielding to God's plan, but that also looks a little bit like letting evil have its way, right? Um, they come to arrest Jesus, and he does not confront them. He does not drive them away. He does not tell them, this is unjust, you can't do this. He allows himself to be arrested and uh, then to be humiliated and to be finally tortured uh, to death. How do we discern the difference between these two faces of faith? When, when do we act boldly to confront evil and change the world and when do we yield? When do we trust God and in trusting God seemingly allow evil to have the last word for now? That is a, a hard question. Um, if anybody here thinks I'm going to give you three steps for figuring this out so that you'll just know. It doesn't work like that. Uh, it, it takes wisdom to be able to walk in the world and to know what faith looks like. Uh, faith means a willingness to risk ourselves, to confront evil, to to find the brokenness in the world and address it, to try to make a change. And faith sometimes means yielding to God when it looks like that's going to mean that we lose. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Uh, there is this promise of God that he will lead us, that he will direct us at the right time in the right way. But that is, <laughs> that is a tricky thing, is it not? To, to know when to push and when not to push. Uh, we, have, we have someone in our own congregation who had a situation at work that was not just. And so that person like pushed back to try to, to try to fight back against a corrupt system. But that's a dangerous thing to do, right? It takes, it takes courage and it takes faith to step into that situation knowing that that, that, could, that could possibly not end well uh, for you. But to stand openly 
publicly against the evil. Um, I know we've, we've also had the situation where uh, at different times, uh, some of us have had, to, have had to be willing to swallow it, uh, have had to be willing to, to suffer evil uh, rather than, uh, I don't know, rather than sort of crusading uh, openly against it. And there's a, a different kind of faith that it takes to trust that God sees and knows and he will judge justly. He's, he's not going to let evil run forever. Uh, there is a day of accountability and sometimes we are not that accountability. <laughs> sometimes we are not the ones who, who force it to happen. And I think this is true, uh, like the, these two faces of faith are true uh, even beyond uh, how we handle situations where there's evil or brokenness in the world. There's, it, it's just not an easy thing to be able to discern how God is, is going to lead us into a, in a particular situation until we're there. Uh, I, I found this quote from Crystal McDowell. She's apparently a, uh, a blogger and uh, does a lot of writing for women's devotionals and things. She says that the Holy Spirit will prompt us in the right direction as we learn to hear his voice and respond in obedience. And I agree. I think that's true. I just think it's trickier than that in real life. <laughs> uh, to learn to hear the voice of God in prayer, you know, to, be, to be led by the Holy Spirit and to recognize what is the voice of the Spirit and what is the voice of my own desire. And if we're honest, some of us, when we say, oh, I think the Lord is leading in this way, we, we mostly mean, I kind of want this. That's not a reliable guide. Okay, if, if, if everything that the Holy Spirit seems to want is stuff that you already want, one of you is unnecessary. <laughs> right? I mean, you, you never have a disagreement with God? Maybe I'm the only one. You know, maybe there's this dark cloud that follows me everywhere I go and just rains on me. But, uh, yeah, I find that sometimes... The desire of my heart is not God's desire. And I have to learn to make my peace with that. That's happening right now as we speak. So uh, my last day here at Redemption is April 30. And I was praying with some people uh, earlier this week, and they're like, oh, how are you doing with this? And it's like, how do you think I'm doing? It's like, well, I... I on the one hand, I'm really struggling. Uh, it feels like every, everything in the way that I add up things in my mind, it doesn't add up well. So we're going to leave here about a year from being able to become Canadian citizens. That's stupid. Like, why would you do that? You know, we're, we're going to leave a couple of years from being able to lock in uh, Canada Pension Plan and Old Age Security. And I think, wouldn't it be better <laughs> to, to lock in some of those things, right? And then go. Uh, if we were citizens and then went, we could come back any time. But it's not going to go down like that. Um, here at the church, I think, uh, I've talked about this before. I feel badly that I talked about this because <laughs> um, I... I talked about how certain things that I've looked forward to are now finally going to happen. They're just going to happen after I leave. Um, that's just a reality. That's just how it is. Now, you guys know that the school across the street is finally going to open this month. They're going to have students over there at the end of this month. And so... Like, the first month that I was here, I went over, I met with the principal, 
I said, oh, you know, really looking forward to working with you and, you know, our church, having a relationship with your school and all this kind of stuff. And she said, uh, we're leaving. Um, and they've been gone for most of the time that I've been here. And so we've waited patiently for them to finish building the building and all these things. Well, it's finally done. And now students are coming back and I'm out. And I think, come on, Lord, that's not right. Uh, I, I don't know what it felt like for Moses to stand on the mountain and look over into the promised land and know, oh, that looks fantastic. And to know, I'm not going, right? This is, this is sometimes how these things go. Um, and this is where I do find comfort in this promise that we are to trust in God with all our hearts and not to lean on our own understanding, uh, to not lean on our own logic, our own plan. Now, I want to be careful how I say this because I actually think that there's a terrible thing that happens in the church where people will set mind and logic against the leading of the Spirit, like they're opposites. And you should just turn off your mind and turn off your logic. I do not believe that, okay? God gave you your mind. He gave you your thinking to guide you and to help you. So those things are gifts. We are to love God with all of our minds. So don't disparage your mind. And at the same time, there is a point at which God can overrule. And he can say, yeah, I know that it doesn't make sense to you. But this is what we're doing. <laughs> this, is, this is how this is going to work. And I have to say in God's defense, not that he needs me to defend him, but I have to say in God's defense that he has a good track record. Like in my life, God has led me to do all kinds of things that didn't totally make sense. And yet, he has, he has produced so much good and so much blessing out of those things. Arguably, coming here in the first place violated a lot of logical things. So I was already happy. Had a job that I loved and believed in, uh, was, was, was doing well financially in that situation. And... And to leave that and to come here created all kinds of financial havoc and other things. Um, but God knows, right? And part of what we're trusting, even though it's tricky with these two faces of faith, that sometimes you boldly confront, sometimes you yield. God knows what he's doing. My invitation to you this morning is, will you go to God to allow him to lead you in faith? Faith is not just something that you do, right? Faith is res responding to something that God is doing. So when God promises, when God leads, are we willing to trust?